Well, hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, wherever you happen to be. Um, again, I am Leonard Weekly. I'm with Microsoft, and uh, I'll give you a quick snippet about me and, and my history. Um, right now, I'm in the Venture Integration Team, where I am doing a lot of mergers and acquisitions. As you know, we're quite active, and we're a serial acquirer. Um, my background also includes working on the Human Genome Project. Um, I've worked in manufacturing. I've worked in high-rise construction in a family business, in all in project management roles. As you can see, I am also PMP certified. And so what I want to get out of today is what, the, what I want to impart on, uh, on you folks is, one, first to have a little bit of fun. Um, there's going to be some tongue-in-cheek. And I want to hit on what I think are very important topics in, in, the, uh, in the project management community and, and start at a really high level and then address Q&A. So I, I will try to stop as frequently as I can to address questions. Uh, so feel free to fire them at me, and also if anybody has any comments or any you know any experiences, go ahead and post those in the chat, and and please do share them. Bear with me while I get going here, and there we are. So there's the introduction slide. Um, so um, start. I guess I start recording live. So I need to hit start recording live. Is that correct? Leonard, we are good to go. All you need to do is click that next arrow, and we can move forward with the presentation. Okay, excellent. Thank you. I seem to be getting a message or an error. Oh, okay. Can I trouble you to try to refresh your, your browser there? Folks, give us just one second to get the presentation up and running for you. We'll try to okay. refresh your console. That might help. Okay. As Leonard did tell you folks, if you do have questions for him and you want to share your experiences or start a kind of a conversation, you can type that into the group chat. And if you don't know how to access it, you have a little widget towards the bottom of your console. It's kind of red in color and it shows maybe three people on it. If you open that, you can type right there and hit submit and we will see your conversations. Are things back for you, Leonard? No, I'm sorry they're not. I'm on the present. Um, I am not seeing. Are, are you folks seeing the slides? Yes, we can see them. Okay, how about this? <laughs> I am happy to forward the slides for you. So if you just want to tell me next, or if you have a presentation okay. handy, you can follow along, and we'll just forward the slides for you in the background and just let us know when you need them moved. <laughs> okay, let's do that. I'll go ahead and uh, open up my deck real quick. So just bear with me while I get that up and running. This is a great example of how do we react uh, to issues. Okay, well let's let's go ahead and we'll move to uh, uh, to number two. And so you, you know when we talk about the universe of projects, uh, as you'll note, which is somewhat commensurate with my background, uh, we really have moved to a very projectized uh, world. And and one of the nice things about PMI is PMI has offered uh, a, a very in depth framework. Uh, but one of the, one of the things that we know and one of the things that uh, as project managers, we learn through the course of our career that the framework is just that. And uh, how you apply the frame in the project management universe and in the projects that you do um, is really uh, is really indicative of the domain in which you're applying that. And, and one of the things that I tell folks is that you need to one first look at the, the domain. So in my case, whether it's a merger or an acquisition, or whether we're developing a software product, uh, we're building a skyscraper, we're building a uh, a, a, a course. Uh, to teach project management, that it's the underlying domain that you have to first take a look at and then how you apply project management. I'll give you an example of that uh, when we take a look at risk. 
um, you know, there are, there are definitely detailed way, ways to take a look at risk planning and risk management, uh, for example, Monte Carlo analysis. Monte Carlo analysis is great if you're sending a man to the moon because of the level of danger, or you're doing, uh, or, or you're doing research uh, and looking for oil, as an example. Uh, but I can tell you, it, it, you know, when I'm doing um, uh, projects in the IT world, I don't typically do and have never done Monte Carlo analysis. It's, it's, it's a type of uh, risk management and risk planning um, that is not commensurate with the domain. So one of the things that I always tell people, again, to reinforce this notion is that as you look at the pragmatic application of project management and utilizing PMI framework and standards, first go to your domain and try to figure out what works. And, and the second piece is to know, one, don't forget project management is not just a science, it's an art. So moving on to slide three now, as, we're, as we really take a look at projects, uh, one of the other things that I've seen, and I, and I can use a real-world example, and th this is one that, that I can share, is so I'm helping to lead the integration of the Skype acquisition. Well, as we started to take a look at the sheer size of implementing and developing a brand new division of a major corporation, it became very evident that this was a big enchilada. And how do we then take and, 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 and you know, execute against our scope and our requirements and meet the end needs and the outcomes and the value driven out of this deal? Well, it became very evident that, you know, it wasn't one project, but it was one, it was, it was a major program made up of many dozens of projects spanning a whole company. And so that, that functional decomposition uh, of the integration work really helped us to put this into manageable pieces. And then also leveraging PMI standards, we'll, we're then able to not only take a tops down perspective, but a bottoms up validation across the whole portfolio of projects. And so this allowed us to put in a PMO structure or what we call an integration management structure and, and then track and manage the project as, uh, as we left the planning phase. One of the key areas, and as we move to, uh, to the next slide, uh, slide four, one of the key areas for us is really defining a stakeholder. And so, you know, typically what I see happen is as people take a look at the customer, the person who's going to receive the value, the benefits, the end product of the project as the single and only customer. Um, what we find out, and I can tell you through uh, my experiences and also the mistakes that I've learned, is, is that your customer is a lot, your stakeholders are a lot broader than just that. So let's, let's take a look at uh, an example. Let's take a look at an IT project where we are delivering a software product to market. We have external customers who will receive the product and who will utilize the project, gain value and benefit. But we also have many internal stakeholders who have a stake in the development and the implementation of that project. So identifying who those stakeholders are, and then identifying why they're a stakeholder. And uh, example, um, a software engineer absolutely is a stakeholder. Why is that person a stakeholder? Because he or she has the responsibility to deliver a piece, and they have a need to be informed. They have a need to be part of the overall communications plan. They have a need to be involved in planning. And so, again, as you take a look at your stakeholder community as a best practice, don't focus only on the end customer. Take a look across the broad spectrum of those folks who are not only involved in the project, but who may be sponsoring the project, who have a need to track uh, the project outside of, uh, outside of the, uh, the product being delivered. For example, for example, your finance department. They need to understand associated costs. They need to understand what your budget is, what your forecast is, what your actuals are, what the variances are. So they are a key stakeholder. And as, as you'll know, as you take a look at your stakeholder, uh, you know, they're, they're part of the, the inputs into planning. They're part of the inputs into communication. Uh, and, and other areas within the PMI framework. So as we move to the next slide, so again, they're not all created equally. And what's important is to iterate, list out 
your stakeholders, list out why they're a stakeholder, and then also to make sure that you understand their roles and responsibilities. One of the things that I'll also say that I see is, uh, and I can tell you I'm seeing this right now, so we're doing a big deal. Everybody's interested. Everybody wants to be involved, and so I have potential stakeholders uh, coming out of the coming out of the weeds in the woods, uh, and and so it's very you know one of the things that I have to do is say okay I understand you want to be involved I understand you feel you have you are a stakeholder and you have a need to be involved or you have a need to be informed let's sit down and talk about what that is and let's understand what your roles and responsibilities so separating the wheat from the chaff it's really important to also identify identify when folks are not your stakeholder, are not part of your team. And so out of that, you should then complete your stakeholder analysis, complete your RACI, and make sure that you have that roster of folks that are, that are part of that overall stakeholder. So I, I'm going to pause real quick um, while I take a quick sip of water, and, uh, and we'll move to the next slide, slide six, and I'll pause to see if there are any questions before we start discussing scopes and requirements. Okay, we have a quiet group today. Which, which is fine. So let's move into scope requirements. And, and some of these cartoons, I think that I think you'll understand. Uh, you'll probably have seen them in the past. Um, and so as we move into the scope and requirements, um, and uh, and I'll use a very a very classic example um, here in a minute. And we'll we'll change industries on you as well. This is really key. Going from your charter, going to your scope understanding the detailed requirements, vetting those out, and ensuring that you have a, a, a traceability component. So as you start to deliver, um, you know, your product, as you start your interim deliverables, that you can absolutely trace those back to, uh, to your scope and to your requirements. So I'll give you two examples. And first, let's start with the high-rise construction industry, where an architect produces a series of architectural di diagrams. Those get translated into, uh, you know, w w into workshop diagrams, are sent to manufacturing. And so I can tell you in, in a past, this is about 10 years ago, we were actually longer than that, we were doing a building in Hong Kong called the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank Building. And there were very clear requirements and scope from the architects, but one of the things that was not translated properly was the storefront components in layouts. As a result, the, uh, the, uh, the contractor, the glazing contractor, came in and made some key decisions uh, themselves on what the scope was. So what they did is they take a look at the conceptual architecture diagrams, went in, and then built out the storefront. Well, can you can imagine as they were about two-thirds of the way through that and the architect showed up on the job site and about had a heart attack. And so the impact of implementing a solution that was not what the architect had desired and not following through on the traceabilities was a major rework of a, of a large storefront component that had impacts on costs and had impacts, um, had impacts to other stakeholders who had to deliver other components, lighting, electrical, plumbing, all of a sudden they're looking at all these components and having to do a, having to do a rework of their plan, having to go back and issue, you know, a change order based upon the issue that, is, that has arisen. Um, you know, other, other key areas which, uh, which you can see as well where you, you build the wrong thing, uh, we'll go back uh, to the IT industry, is when you are delivering features and functions and you do not trace those back to your project plan. Example, where you have a feature you're delivering, part of your user interface, and you have scope and requirements. Those requirements, or business requirements, get translated into functional requirements and the technical specifications. Well, unless you map that requirement through those three deliverables, you have the potential to deliver the wrong solution. And so I've seen this in a number of areas where you have a junior team managing a major feature. They do not practice requirements traceability, and so you, there's no way to track or trace that business requirement to the end solution. As a result, and I've seen this happen a number of times, you end up with a solution with features that, one, weren't part of the scope, or features that were implemented 
that were not part of the original business requirements. Now you can manage the impact that has on release schedules, where either one, you've got to determine we need to pull the feature, or two, we either pull it or we do have enough time to go back and fix the problem. Uh, this, is, this is, again, a, a key part of not only your planning, but making sure that as you're, as you're executing and controlling your project, that you continually go back and do requirements traceability. What, I've, what I recommend folks do is that you have that as a task within your project plan. So whether it is you're beginning to plan uh, or do a rolling wave approach to planning where now you're going to a different feature set or planning that, or whether you're going back and saying, well, now we're going to plan and implement the storefront component of our high-rise building, that at that point you have a task in there, then that task in those requirements traceability, and that you have a report out or a communications piece of that to ensure and to validate that indeed we have the requirements identified and we have a plan commensurate with the requirements to implement the solution and that as a result, the value and the benefit of that solution will indeed be realized uh, at some time after the project is completed. Uh, a big area, and, I, and I'm sure folks have discovered this in the past as well, where you know maybe you've been on a project and boy, you've missed a requirement. And what I can say, even in, I mean, even today, and, I, I, and I've had this happen recently where I've gone back and I've taken a look at the requirements and gone back to the project manager and said, hey, what about this requirement? I don't see it in your traceability matrix. And you can imagine the surprise on that PM's face when they go, oh, yes, Mr. Weekly, you're absolutely correct. And at that point, boy, you've got an issue. And uh, that issue is an issue that gets reported and escalated, and how you, how you remediate that issue can, you know, can, can become a big problem, especially if it impacts uh, your timeline and or introduces additional risk. Moving on to, uh, to slide seven, so let's talk about planning. And so we, we've talked about different components uh, as we take a look at our charters, our scope, a written project plan, as we take a look at and including, uh, you know, a deliverable-based work breakdown structure, uh, which I find is really key. So th they're all, you know, they're, everybody has a different approach to how they like to plan, and that's part of the, the art. PMI is very prescriptive, prescriptive on the science, but what I can tell you is from a pragmatic uh, perspective, uh, the, the three, the, the, areas, the, the areas that I really like to focus on is one, making sure that we have a charter as part of the input, that charter is signed off by key stakeholders that are identified as part of the RACI. The sponsors review that charter, which includes, here's how much money I'm going to spend, and here's the, the period of time I'm going to spend that money, and they have explicit sign-off. And then upon completion, what I like to do is I send out a communication. So effective immediately, the charter has been signed off. We are now moving into, into detailed scoping and detailed planning. So that charter then starts to translate into a set of business requirements or in this case, you, in the, in the uh, hires construction, you're going to now take your, your charter, your scope, your high-level scope, and start to define architecturals, and you're starting to, to define what are the manufacturing, engineering, shop drawings, detailed drawings that need to come out of that. Um, as we move from, you know, the, the, the charter into, from an IT perspective, the business requirements, and we start to take a look at how those requirements are, are laid out, when the value needs to be realized based upon those requirements, remembering that as part of your plan, you're delivering value. You have to identify what that value or the benefit is, who the beneficiary is, and then putting in a plan commensurate with achieving those end state results. So we move from scope, we move charter, detailed scope, requirements. From there, we then move into developing our work breakdown structure. So the WBS, a deliverable-based WBS, is an absolute best practice. It is a planning exercise that I like to have facilitated, and typically, uh, depending upon the size of the project, uh, typically what I will do is I will bring in somebody to facilitate it. I'm an active member of the team, and as an active member of that team, I like to be involved in the planning process. Chances are I'm going to own deliverables. Chances are I'm, I'm going to be doing communications. Chances are I'm going to be doing risk management. And so having those detailed plans and your detailed work breakdown structure facilitated as part of a planning workshop 
is absolutely key. And so at that point, I tell folks, hey, we're tool agnostic. We're going to whiteboard this. We're going to do this as part of a as part of a project launch. And everybody who owns a deliverable owns defining their work breakdown structure. And then from there, moving into providing estimates. So getting to the plan and getting to your estimates is not just the job of a project manager. The project manager is ultimately accountable for ensuring that they get to the plan, but they're also accountable for making sure they're defining who is responsible to build their deliverable base work breakdown structure for the deliverables that they're going to own. A lot of times uh, you see in, in our world today, because we move so fast, we kick projects off, we have so many of them, this is where I see PMs take a shortcut, and for example, if you're an IT project manager, you're developing a course, or regardless of what your domain is, chances are you know your domain really well. And can you sit down and build out a project plan? Probably so. Should you? Probably not, and for the reasons that, that I have already mentioned. And so one of the things that can happen as a result of moving forward and saying, well, I know my area, I know the people I'm working with, I'm going to build my plan out, and then, uh, then I'm going to vet it. What has a tendency to happen when you take that approach is you don't get buy-in. You don't get ownership, 100% ownership of those deliverables. What you end up getting is compliance, where, for example, you have an engineer that comes up and says, I've got six projects going on. Uh, you have your plan. Those are my little, yeah, that looks good enough. Uh, we'll get it done. And then what happens is they don't follow the plan. The estimates are incorrect. The plan then is no longer representative of the work that actually needs to get done. So again, going back to planning and making sure that you have your charter, you have your scope, the requirements are defined. You're also including your risk management plan, your change management plan. And in those plans, uh, you, have, uh, you have the participants of the folks, the team members who own the deliverables or who are impacted by changing conditions within the project. Again, reinforcing the next slide, uh, slide number eight, and I think I'm a little bit ahead of my slides, but again, it, it's not a one-person endeavor. Um, and it, it really encapsulates using many people and I, making sure that the, I, the stakeholders who you've identified in your RACI, RACI being a component of planning, resource planning, that you have the right folks in that planning workshop. So let's move uh, to the next slide, and um, let's talk a little bit about the language of your stakeholders. And so this is a key area, and this is where I think uh, differentiates a real solid PM uh, uh, from a PM that may not be as, as solid ground. So as an example, you understand that your business customer is a key stakeholder. They absolutely do not get geek speak, okay? Or I'll, I'll go back to, uh, to uh, the construction. Actually, let's go back to the Human Genome Project, which was really interesting. Working with a series of bioinformatics, bioinformatics folks who uh, have very detailed uh, biology tests, um, and they do, they, you know, as a project manager, I don't speak their language. And so translating and their language into project management speak is very, very difficult to do. As a project manager, you have to understand that of your stakeholders. You have to understand their communications need. You have to understand how to translate their vernacular into the vernacular of the project management uh, framework and within the individual disciplines that are involved. So a business requirement uh, defining a specific feature on, uh, on a software product coming from a customer is very different than defining that into a functional spec, which is say, now here's how I'm going to take and functionally represent that business requirement. 
as you take a look at moving through the next piece of that and you start to, taking a look at your technical specifications, uh, which are typically developed by the engineer, you'll see that the language that is used is very, very technical. And you'll also note that the language that is used by the customer or the sponsor of your project is very, very different, different as well. The ability to translate that uh, is absolutely keys. An example of that, another example of that is your engineer provides you status. You're using requirements traceability uh, to make sure that part of their status and the tasks and the deliverables are, are, are mapped back to requirements, but you're also making sure that as you translate their status, which is what I'll call geek speak or engineering speak, and you're translating that into the status report you have to use for your customer, that you're not using a lot of the same terminology, especially acronyms, which your customer is not going to understand, that you're, you're translating that into the language of your customer. Uh, so part of, the, you know, that, that's a very important part of your communications planning is understanding who your stakeholder is, understanding what language they speak, and how you're going to translate that into a communications plan that will be directed at the, at the consti constituent stakeholders uh, within the, uh, the core team and extended teams and the sponsors. Uh, very key. Uh, you'll find as you present your status, if you haven't translated that, uh, you have a tendency to lose the audience who's the recipient of that communication, and you're going to spend a lot of time uh, trying to explain the status um, because you have not translated that. What can happen in that case is that as a project manager, you can take a credibility hit. Your, your customer, your key stakeholder customer may then come back and say, look, we're not comfortable. We don't know where this project is really headed because we're seeing a lot of terminology and we're seeing a lot of, we're seeing the engineering vernacular, which we don't understand. Uh, at that point, uh, I've seen customers start to dive, customers and especially sponsors, start to dive really, really deep into your project. And um, as project managers, we, we like to have a lot of autonomy. We like to, you know, be the masters of our domain and, and, and lead our teams. Uh, and it can be very uncomfortable the moment that you have a key stakeholder that's doing a deep dive because of your inability to articulate and communicate uh, in the language that they speak. So again, as we move to the next slide, which kind of builds on that, um, you know, as we talk about status, you know, <laughs> at that point, is your, is your, you know, is your, are your stakeholders scared? And absolutely, the, as the moment that you start to generate anxiety as a result of that, uh, lack of proper communications, communications planning, um, you're going to, you're going to have a series of stakeholders that are going to really start to lose confidence in the project and the project's ability to deliver. And, you know, I can tell you in, in recent learnings where we've had very, very senior level uh, at the corporate level stakeholders who have a vested interest in, in ensuring that, one, they receive status commensurate with their level. And an example of that is I have a key stakeholder that is a corporate vice president says, I want to know high level status. But he says, what I really want to know is what decisions I need to make and when do I need to make them. And so what we ended up having to do is understanding that stakeholders' communications needs and working into our communications plan a decision-making model, then going back to our project schedule and making sure we have a clear delineation of tasks where we are going to ask for incremental decisions. And as a result of that, we were able to improve uh, the communications to the corporate level of Microsoft and ensure we're engaging them at the right time with the right message and with the right asks. So what that ended up doing is it ended up improving the relationship with the executive sponsors. It gave them the information that they needed in a timely manner when they needed, and it allowed them to make key decisions at the right time. So this really helps us to stay on track. It really helps us to main, maintain a relationship at the appropriate levels, commensurate with our communications plan and the folks who we're communicating with. So I'm going to take another quick pause. <laughs> so as we, knew, as, we move to the, uh, as we move to the next slide, 
uh, slide 11. Uh, again, talking a little bit about status, inputs, outputs, and process, it really is about getting to the truth. And, you know, PMI is very prescriptive, and, you know, my intent is not to make this a, a, a class on PMI or a class on getting your PMP, but that, that's, I think that's, you know, another webinar for another time. But doing the due diligence, this is the real key message that I'm trying to impart. Do the due diligence. Make sure you do, you spend the right amount of time doing your communications planning. Um, you know, for the most part, we have, we have practitioners who are experts in their domains, who have team members who are experts in their, their domains, they know how to deliver. They know how to engineer. They know how to provide solutions. They understand the requisite value and the benefits that will be received as part of that. That's, that's typically not the problem. Um, the problem um, that I see, one, is planning, which we've covered, but the other one is communications. And um, this is a skill. Uh, that one, um, as a project manager, um, it, it's my philosophy you need to develop. And an example of that would be precision question and answer. So when I am presenting status to a senior executive, I don't ramble on. I am to the point. I, I, I communicate with precision, and then I pause. And I wait for that executive to answer the question. And then I give that, that, the, the answer to that question Again, with precision, I answer only the specific question, I don't ramble on, and once the question is answered, I pause. And I give that executive, uh, you know, an opportunity to ask a follow-on question, and if I don't get one, I move to the next piece of my status report and in the same manner. And so that's an example of precision question and answering. It's a skill that as a project manager and a program manager, I've learned to develop over the years as a means to impart successful communications. Um, I also put that as part of my communications plan to the executives. The reason I do that is so the rest of my team understand the translation of their detailed status, their technical status, into something that's consumable by a different stakeholder and a different audience. Another good example is, is presentation style. So it's it's not only how you articulate your com communications, but how do you show up? And, and, and do you show up in a, in a manner that, um, that uh, demonstrates your ability to communicate, demonstrates your authority within the project, uh, demonstrates that you absolutely understand where your project is at, you understand the status, and you can articulate at, at the many different levels uh, of the stakeholders who are the recipients of the communications that you need to impart. So again, just to, to reinforce, communication style, how you show up, understanding the communications needs of the different stakeholders and ensuring those communications are customized to the needs of the stakeholder will give you a ton of credibility that will add, you know it, it, it will it will it will take you further into your career and so because you have that credibility you're going to be requested for future projects they're going to they're going to look at you and say man Jane did a great job her engagement with us was good she showed up well she tracked her project her communications were excellent uh, her project got completed delivered the value delivered the benefits boy we've got a we've got a strategic project we want to put Jane or John on uh, because of how they've shown up and how they've, dem and they've demonstrated their ability to communicate to the senior teams and to manage their project. So again, I think, uh, you know, a lot of times, um, and, and I see this, you know, PMs don't do communications plans. And as a result, they move forward in an ad hoc manner, and it really does put their, it puts their credibility at, at risk. It definitely does. And I can tell you that from personal experience. That's one I had to learn the hard way. And I was fortunate enough at the time that I had a really good mentor. I had a very good manager who said, Len, take a step back. Go back to your communications plan. Go back to your communication style. And we will, and we will, we will, enforce that or will will support that with providing you additional training so that you get better. And over time and over a number of projects, I did get better. And my ability to articulate at the correct level was was really key to my success and to uh and to getting involved in, in much more strategic projects. So let's let's move to the next slide. Um and I think the key on this slide and, and this is funny. I see this all the time, and, um, and I see it in many different industries, and it really is 
the difference between a risk and an issue. And um, for those of you who have, have looked at PMI and have got your PMP, it's very clear within that framework the difference between the, the risk and the issue. However, as a practicing project manager, you may understand that, but again, the majority of your stakeholders don't understand that. And so part of my communications and my communication communications planning um, is to make sure that each stakeholder understands the difference between the risk and the issue. So as we take a look at, at, at risk, you know, it's an unplanned event. It uh, typically, folks look at it as, uh, as a negative unplanned event. Um, however, risks can also have positive outcomes. You can realize a risk, and as a result of the risk being realized, you can have a positive outcome that can improve the benefit of, uh, of the product delivery um, and can also improve the state of the project that you're managing. Um, as we know, uh, risks are part of, uh, a part of our planning process. So, you know, how we mitigate risks, what are contingency plans for the risks that are identified, and, and then how do we handle risks that are not identified, so the unknown. How, how do we handle the unknowns in regards to change management, as an example. Um, and then making sure that folks understand, well, you know, once the risk has been realized uh, and we're moving through our contingency plan, meaning our mitigation strategy has not worked, that risk then becomes an issue. And taking a look at the impact of the issue and statusing that issue. So did that issue throw our status yellow? Meaning we have, uh, we have issues, key tasks, key deliverables may be, their timeline may be missed. However, the end milestone or other key milestones are still not in jeopardy because we have enough float on our schedule to accommodate uh, the issue. Um, also understanding the domino effect. So a lot of times what happens is you have an issue that crops up that has a domino effect within your project. Uh, you have a feature that not, may not be able to get delivered, and as a result, that feature impacts the ability to deliver the end product. At that point, your issue really has turned your status red. You're going to miss key milestones. You're going to miss key components of your scope. And so, again, just to reinforce, the difference between risk and issues is fundamental. The, the, the ability to articulate those to non-practicing project managers is really key. What will happen is everybody will take a look at that risk and, and really compound it. And as we move to the next slide, look, let's not pour gas on the fire. If it's a risk, let's call it as a risk. Let's make sure we articulate as part of our communications. We have identified the risk. Here's our risk management plan. Here's the impact to that risk. And if, in fact, that risk does translate into an issue, let's make sure that we manage that issue and we, take, we course correct, we communicate accordingly on how we're going to course correct um, that issue to get back on track. And the one thing that I tell people, and I see this happen, look, when an issue arises in the project, it's going to create a lot of anxiety. And as a, as a result of that anxiety, there is what I call deflection. So at the end of the day, somebody's got to own the issue. At the end of the day, the uh, project manager owns it and is accountable and needs to make sure that that issue is assigned to the proper core team core team stakeholder, core teammate, to get that issue resolved and ensure we have course correction. What that does not mean, that does not mean we play the blame game. And so I see this happen uh, in many instances where you have a major issue crops up and the first thing that a key stakeholder or sponsor may ask is, okay, whose fault is this? You know, who, who's to blame? And <laughs> as the project manager, again, how you show up, how you demonstrate your large and in charge is key to managing the perceptions of the person who's asking that particular question. And in the end, it's not about the blame game. It's not about deflection. It's about accountability and responsibility and owning the problem and making sure you demonstrate to your key stakeholders and, and sponsors that you absolutely 
own the problem and that you have a plan in place to course correct, that you clearly articulate at the level commensurate with that stakeholder the impact of that issue and how you're going to course correct, course correct that issue. And, and again, as you can understand, issues create anxiety. As a project manager, as the person who should be large and in charge, how you show up, how you manage that issue, how you course correct is absolutely key to your credibility. So let's move to, uh, to the next slide and, and let's talk a little bit about tools. So we see a plethora of tools out there from Prima's, Primavera to MS Project to Excel. <laughs> I see a lot of projects managed out of Excel, and, and, and there are a lot of purists in the area of tools. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of like, a, I'll give you an example, as you take a look at um, the Mac and the PC, well, there's a little bit of, you know, what I call technical religion involved there, where Mac folks are very passionate. Well, same thing, as you take a look at Primavera, and I'll give you an example where you see uh, major construction companies, um, major engineering uh, companies such as Shell, um, and other companies that who, who rely heavily on Primavera. Uh, you see other companies, smaller companies, who use uh, Microsoft Project or project server. Um, I also see, as I said, many times uh, folks are using Excel. At the end of the day, my advice is twofold. It doesn't matter where you manage the project. It's can you demonstrate your ability to manage the projects that are commensurate with your organizational standards. Um, so you can manage it on the back of a matchbook, then manage it on the back of a matchbook if, it, if the project's that small. And, and obviously there's a little bit of tongue-in-cheek involved in there, but the, the, message, the message that I'm trying to impart is that we don't, tools do not make up project management. Project management utilizes tools to get the job done, status reporting, tracking schedule, understanding critical path all of those things. And if you have a tool that can do that, and you know, I've seen folks develop complex uh, Excel workbooks that calculate critical path. Now, I think it's kind of funny that they do that. They're Excel gurus, but they don't like Project, or they don't like Primavera, or they don't like another tool. And, and so as a result, they're able to successfully manage their projects in Excel. Now, Obviously, I like to move them on to a standard project management tool because organizationally, um, you know, are within your program management office, tool standards are, are, are key. It, so if I am running my project in uh, a standard project management tool and my partner is running it in a non-standard, they're running it on the back of a napkin or they're running it in Excel, if, in fact, that project manager has to leave that project for whatever reason, the ability to pick up that project and ramp up very quickly as the new project manager is going to be key. If I'm going into a tool that is non-standard or I don't know or I don't understand, it's going to inhibit my ability to come up quickly. And so the key message there is choose your tools, choose them wisely, use them commensurate with the level of the size and complexity of the project you're managing, and ensure that if somebody has to step in, that they can clearly step in and get up to speed very, very quickly. This is kind of the hit by the bus uh, theory, if you will. Um, and if you don't have an organizational standard, then try to put one in place because I think that's going to be key when you have a group of project managers who are either working in a specific organization or working out of a PMO, that those standards are in place and that they're properly trained in those standards and those tools. So, you know, the, 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 the project management tools is, is no different than uh, the tools a mechanic uses. And you'll have a mechanic that will use different tools for different jobs, and not every mechanic is made the same. And you may have one mechanic that uses a crescent wrench and another mechanic that uses a pair of vice grips. In the end, are they able to achieve the job? Absolutely. Do they deliver the benefits of the value? Absolutely. And so that's my note on tools for today. Um, so let's move forward. I think we're running a little bit ahead of schedule, which is good. So, so what does project success like? So as we 
get to the end of our project, and I've alluded to this in, in key pieces of the project, as we get to the end of the project and we complete the project, what does success look like? And part of your planning that you do and part of the charter that you develop is to clearly articulate what project success looks like. So many times uh, I see folks that come back and say, well, yeah, we completed that project. It was on time. It was on project. You know, we did a good job on requirements traceability. We completed the scope, and they have a big celebration. And then in six months, the sponsor comes back and says, yeah, we didn't achieve the benefits of this project. And so in the end, was the project successful? No, absolutely it was not. And so this is this is a key. So as a project manager, when your when your project is done and you delivered the pro, the end product to the customer, your project is not done. And you don't just jump into administrative closeout. Part of your project that I think is just hugely important and I see far too many times I don't see this happen is that folks don't measure the project benefits whether it's a return on the investment, whether it's a new product in the marketplace that has a return on the investment, whether it's a new feature, whether it's a new skyscraper, that you go back and as part of your plan, you have to understand what the benefits realization timeline is, and you have to track that. Another example, as we integrate Skype as a new division here at Microsoft, we know that the moment that we're done integrating Skype, and they are a fully operational division, we know that our work has not completed. So we have a process that we put in place and we call that post-integration governance. The sole purpose of that process is to ensure that the benefits of that acquisition are realized. And those benefits may happen over many years' time. At that point, there is a PM or an integration management director whose role it is not only to ensure that the integration is managed and, and executed well, but whose role is to stay with that integration through the governance period and to ensure that those benefits are realized. In many cases, because of the size and complexity of the work we do, we'll get through we'll get through a period of time during governance where we start seeing where certain benefits are not being realized. What can happen then is that can spawn a project. We take a look at, okay, why is this benefit not being realized? What do we need to do to course correct this benefit and how, not being realized? And again, benefits realization is that part of our risk management plan. What do we do if we, you know, how do we mitigate that? How do we track? If it becomes an issue, how do we course correct? And so this is where I see, um, you know, many large projects ultimately fail is because they don't have the post-project uh, governance period where they map and they manage the benefits realization um, that the project managers move very quickly uh, to administrative closeout. And so setting this context with your sponsors very early and making sure you have very clear decisions and approval on how the governance period or the benefits realization part of the project is going to be managed is, is, is very, very clearly outlined and planned. Now, there, there are two options that can happen in that case. One is your sponsor moves the benefits realize, realization or governance to a, a functional line manager. So this functional line manager is, is responsible for the support, continuing support of the feature of the product that you've delivered. That functional line manager uh, will manage it through the governance, and if the benefits aren't being realized, will spin up a project uh, that may call you, they may call you back in or may not, uh, to course correct. And, and you, you see that you see that a lot, especially in the software industry where you know, we deliver features and uh, sometimes those features are very well received. They achieve their benefits. Sometimes they're not well received. And we have to go back and take a look and do some root cause analysis and take a look at the root cause and then course correct. And that can mean everything from, you know, from expanding the feature set and, it, and or it can also mean we're going to pull that feature set, which means we go to the core product and we take a look at what engineering work has to be done in order to extract that feature set and to ensure any de feature dependencies are identified and our next release uh, will have that specific uh, feature either enhanced or, or pulled out. 
Uh, so I think we've seen that clearly uh, for some of the uh, online properties that we see uh, who have done very recent uh, 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 implementations of multiple features where they have not been well received. And we, we, we won't call them out, but any of you who uh, are, are into social uh, social media and online a lot will know who some of those are and may have experienced that. Again, I think part of that is, um, you know, did they have a, a clear benefits realization plan? And, you know, it's interesting, you know, as you take a look at PMI, um, you know, PMI is, 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 does not do enough to take a look at benefits, benefits realization. It's mentioned. Uh, it's 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 I would say lightly part of the uh, the project management framework, but pragmatically this is the one that folks miss the, quite quite often. And you know again if I can impart onto you, your project is not done until the benefits are realized. How you manage and track benefits realization on a time continuum. Um, and ensuring, again, if you have benefits realized over multiple years, there's an amortization period that, that needs to be clearly the value of the dollar today as opposed to the value of dollars sometime in the future when the benefit is realized is another key component of that. But making sure that you have a plan and whether you manage it as a project manager for your project or you hand that off to a functional line manager uh, or somebody else who will then take that piece and, and move it forward um, is, is absolutely key. Um, you know, we see a lot of projects that get done and again are successful, they go through an administrative uh, closeout and then we find out later on down the line that that project uh, was not the right project. It was not the right project, it was not the right project at the right time. And um, you know, you need, to, you need to take a look at that, you know, very, very early. So, well, that should be the end of the project. Is it always the end of your project? And so one of the things that can happen, and as you take a look, and we'll, we'll move to the next slide now, slide 16, one of the things that can happen is you can then take a look at the benefits realization and understand that there may be course corrections, okay? You may, not, you may start to realize the benefit, but the metrics you put in place to measure benefit realization, you know, you may not be quite hitting the mark. Okay, so you may make some adjustments to a feature. You may make uh, some, you know, in your skyscraper, you may make what they call as-built. So uh, we're going to do an as-built on the top of the skyscraper so that we can change certain feature sets because the architect didn't like what we, what we, uh, what we constructed for them. Uh, and so here's, here's the thing that I also see happen, and, and uh, I, I call this a, uh, uh, this a, a runaway project. And so what happens is the project never ends. And um, they implement a, a, a new feature or they implement a change in order to realize the benefit and you're the project manager and you continually process these changes. And so, you know, understanding not only the benefits realization but making very, very clear on what your exit criteria and success metrics look like is key. And I see this all the time in the software industry where these are, you know, they're never ending projects. They go on year after year after year after year. And, um, you know, at that point we're, we're taking a look at, well, you know, was this really a project? Did we realize the benefits? And then here's the key. Did we execute to ops? So did we understand the exit criteria, and then did we, did we execute against that exit criteria and hand that end product over to ops? We know we're going to, you know, in the software industry, we, we know we're going to see bugs. We know we're going to have to have quick fixes. We know we're going to discover security problems. But, you know, at the end of the day, is it that project manager's job to address all of those? No, you're in production. Project manager needs to measure the benefits realization. Once the benefits are realized, officially closes down his or her project, has an exit criteria that demonstrates an execution to operations so that the ops folks, the folks that need to support it, then take it over, and then they adjust any issues that they see from an operational perspective. So I think we're within four minutes of our time. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the talk. Uh, and again, the intent being to let's hit it high level, let's be pragmatic, um, and let's make sure that we're pragmatic not only from a domain 
perspective, but the application of the project management framework uh, to the domain itself. So I appreciate everybody's time today. And um, I believe my contact information is out there, and I'm always open for questions or for emails. Great. Thank you so much, Leonard. Actually, we do have just a couple minutes remaining. We have received a few questions under the QA tab. Are you able Let's to see that? And do you want to take a couple? Yeah, sure. Let me go through these. Um, so let's start. Let's start at the top. Dennis, can you know, HR tells us to stay, wins the lottery instead of gets hit by the bus. Uh, so I'm I'm going to struggle. I'm going to ask I'm going to ask Dennis to provide a little bit of uh, um, uh, provide a little bit of a uh, more context around that. Um, what I think I think you're talking to Dennis is really around. Um, you know what happens to somebody um, is hit. You know we call it the hit by the bus theory, or you know, or, or they win the lottery and they're and, and they're gone. Um, and um, you know HR is then saying, well, no, we need you to stay, or we want you to stay, or obviously there are compelling reasons not to have a key project management uh, resource. Um, so if that is in case the uh, the context of uh, of the question, here's here's what I can tell you. Um, if I win the lottery. Um, I can tell you from a personal perspective, I would probably continue doing what I do. I love it, um, and it's not it, you know it's not uh, you know it's, it, it is a passion. It's a, I like to take my time uh, with project management. Uh, I love to teach. Uh, I love to coach, and so it's a major part of my life. Um, however. There are lots of folks out there, and, you know, for obvious reasons. Uh, if uh, you know you win the uh, win the lottery, you may be uh, living on some beautiful island with palm trees and 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 sipping drinks with umbrellas, which is great. The 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 responsibility we have as a project manager is is to make sure that you exit properly and you exit well because that's how you're going to be remembered. And um, making sure that you have a proper handoff. And remember, a handoff of a project is almost like a little project in itself. Make sure you hand it off correctly. All right, let's move down. Oh, not familiar with PM. PM is an absolute formal process within PMI. And it has inputs, process, and outputs. And you can go to PMI's website, and you can actually take a look at the PMBOK. Um, you can download it in digital, or you can buy it in book form. And what I tell folks is, you remember, the, the PMBOK is a framework, and that PMI provides you with a framework. But there are a lot of books on communications planning. There are a lot of books on project scheduling. And it is those books that complement the framework. So let's talk about uh, what resources are available for better ones uh, in regards to communications planning. Um, so let's talk about communications planning resources. There are multiple types of resources. There are the, the there's the medium which the communications are delivered. Uh, those can be websites. Those can be Word documents. Um, uh, they can be portals. They can be presentations. And then there's the resources that need to be available to develop the communication. So I, I don't do my status reports in a vacuum. I actually do my status reports with the with the with the core team or for programs. I do my status reports with my project managers who deliver those in Project Server. I then consume them. I summarize them up and I deliver them back. <laughs> and I ask for my project manage, managers or my core team members to validate it, and then um, I use the output of that into a PDF form then to deliver it. And or at the executive level, I'll develop slides out of out of PowerPoint or whatever tool uh, that you uh, that you uh, that you decide you want to use. Um, so back, Dennis, is another question. Um, am I saying that most failed projects are a result of uh, poor planning and B, poor communications? So yes, uh, you know, the, the, you know, I know folks have heard this. You know, you can either, uh, uh, you know, plan to fail or fail to plan. Look, projects fail because of bad planning. Absolutely, and planning, you know, planning is just not your project schedule. Uh, and so the, the, the pen box is very pers prescriptive. Do projects fail as a, as a set of communications? They can. And so if I miscommunicate my requirements, 
and they're not documented correctly, can my project fail? Absolutely. Now, does the project fail because I'm a bad communicator? No, I may not fail because I'm a bad communicator as far as communicating status, communicating up to executives. But again, as I mentioned earlier, that, that, does have, that does lend to a certain level of credibility that you project, as well as confidence that your, your key sponsors may have uh, uh, in your ability to communicate. So I've seen where you know, folks have been poor communicators, but, but just awesome project managers. They get the job done, the projects deliver, um, but they need help in the communication side of it. Um, so can we categorize stakeholder um, as a, I'm not sure I understand, as the VE or VE stakeholders? I think we're going to need some clarification on that one. Um, I'm not understanding the context of it. So let me open it up. Maybe I'm missing something. Category stakeholders versus vendor or dash VE stakeholders. Yeah, sorry, Abdul. I'm not quite sure what your question is. Um, but if you want to try to restate it uh, real quickly, maybe we have enough time that uh, uh, that I can get it addressed. 